In this lesson, we're looking at biological classification. We have quite a number of different points to cover here, but they are all very linked, so uh, along with some guidance as well. Right, so we know that studying living organisms and their surrounds requires a great deal of data and organisation of that data. So it might be in determining the type of ecosystem they live in, the type of interactions that they have, or how they reproduce within their environment. Now, classification systems or taxonomies are ways to classify and sort living things into groups based on their similarities, right? So it can help us see the full range of life on Earth, observe trends and patterns, and better understand the relationships between organisms and within the groups of organisms. It also gives scientists a common language to communicate with as well. Right, classification systems are, you know, for organisms are considered hierarchical and that shows that there are layers of relatedness. So within the really high layers, there's a really, so in this case, these ones, there's really broad information and they're more inclusive. There's quite a number of different species that fit inside them, while the lower levels are less inclusive and they contain really specific information. Next. The difficulties lie within the how of classifying and grouping organisms. So, for example, uh, you need to classify the items found in the lolly aisle at the supermarket. You could choose to organise them based on shape, colour, size, ingredient, flavours, brand, whatever you want, right? No one way of organising would be right or wrong, but no system of organising would ever encompass every minute detail of every single product, right? The way I interpret it is going to be very different to the way someone else interprets it and organizes it, but it's not that they would be wrong, okay? It's just that that's more convenient or, you know, logical to them. The same applies for biology. So context is incredibly important when we're talking about creating these taxonomies. When creating a system of classification for organisms, the groupings can be based on really obvious traits, right? In our sugar aisle example, um, you know, we're talking you know, wrapped versus unwrapped or individually wrapped versus not individually wrapped. But regardless of any general way of grouping, it's going to ignore the really small, subtle complexities of members in that group. So sometimes it's these exact uh, little subtle differences that creates the range and complexity of life on Earth. So while we need to use classification systems and they are important, we've also got to consider from the outset, you know, they are open to interpretation, they are temporary and changeable as new information becomes available, and they have to be considered in context, in the context they were originally created. So that having been said, organizational, group, organizational groups sorry, can be based on a number of different things. We're talking physical features, we can talk methods of reproduction, and we can also talk molecular sequences in the genome. And so once new information like the genetic sequencing information becomes available, the groupings can become more specific. We have already grouped organisms based on their reproductive methods. Okay, K and R selected organisms based on, uh, sorry, they exist on that spectrum based on the way they take advantage of their environmental conditions and reproduce. So we can describe that by talking about how they allocate their own resources, time and energy into growing and reproducing. So if you need to brush up on some of these ideas, I recommend going and rewatching our lesson on K and R selected organisms. Now, if we group on physical features, that's our most logical one based on our observations. So initially organisms were grouped, uh, you know, with whatever information we had about them and that was really only what we could see. Now, Carl Linnaeus, he was a multi-talented individual. He was a botanist, a zoologist, a taxonomist and a physician. And he decided to make some order out of the chaos in the natural world. So in the 1730s, he published Systema Natura, which outlined the hierarchical nature of living organisms. And he divided them into categories like animal, vegetable and mineral and included about 10,000 separate organisms just in this one, you know, book, most of which of them uh, were plants. Now, he subsequently updated it over and over again until uh, he was putting out an edition with something like 2,400 pages. We call this type of organization Linnaean classification after this guy. Now, at the time, the names of species often did not reflect any organization or consistency, and they often had really ridiculously long scientific names. So to counter this, Linnaeus made a bit of a framework, and he said, here's a set of rules or guidelines, and it's going to help you organize things. So he only used the information available to him at the time, and these were the physical features of the organisms. And he organized groups within groups, and he labeled each of them, and that hierarchical structure showing the organism traits became, um, you know, more similar the lower down the group that we got. 
So we know now that the, you know, with further information that some of the things that they classified together in the same group are not right. So like birds and butterflies, oh, they both have wings, they must be related. We now know because more information has come about because these are changeable taxonomies that, you know, we can make an update. Now, Linnaean classification split organisms into groupings, and initially the three domains, which encompass all types of life, they were the first foundational grouping. Now, after this, organisms are classified into the following kingdoms, so five different kingdoms there, and then it goes down like this, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now, the best way to remember these is, you know, you can make a whole bunch of acronyms out of that. Um, my personal favourite involves Katy Perry every single time. Now, an organism, uh, sorry, an organism will fit into a subsection of all of these groups and they'll have a full scientific categorization based on these features. You know, and so if you look in any Wikipedia page, you will see all of that organization right there. Creating this framework was really, really significant in the scientific community, but the legacy that comes from this is actually binomial nomenclature. Now, binomial nomenclature is a way of describing organisms down to their genus and species level. Without these levels within that hierarchy that Linnaeus cre created, the consistent and abbreviated names could not occur, and this is what we're used to seeing. So binomial nomenclature comes with a bunch of conventions, right? Standard conventions that we must do every time. The genus is capitalised, the species is not. When typed out, both names have to be in italics, if it's handwritten, then we underline them. And if you shorten it further, the genus can be shortened. Oh, that's terrible. Sorry, spelling error. Using the first initial only. So you will actually see that if you've got all the way here, and you'll see that this here is the binomial nomenclature. Now, an interesting discussion which stems from the classification structure we use is about the classification level for species down the bottom, that most specific level. And the species is that basic unit of classifying organisms. It is the most specific level of the hierarchy. But what actually defines whether an organism is from one species or another and what separates them from one another? So not all scientists agree, so there are multiple definitions for the word species. Now, species are classified depending on the context. If you jump into Wikipedia, you will see all these different contexts here. And it plays into those ideas around morphology being only one aspect of organization of an organism. So sometimes species are further split into grouping known as subspecies, which occur because there's variation within a population. You look at humans, right? When that variation becomes significant, it can still be, you know, it's still subtle enough that the organism can still breed and produce viable offspring together. So you're talking like your dog breeds or whatever. But if you have a look at these different contexts, you will see there are so many different ways we can interpret species. Now, as with any sets of rules, there's always a number of exceptions. So while one definition of species considers that only organisms within the same species can interbreed in the wild and produce viable offspring, there are examples of organisms of different species which can interbreed, although it's usually in a, like a zoo context. It's not usually in the wild. So some examples. A zorse. A mule is a hybrid of a donkey and a horse, and we'll talk about that quite a bit. A liger. A wolfen, yes, that is a real word. And there are also some plant species such as Eucalyptus, Melaleuca, uh, Carimbia, and Callistemon, which are interestingly all Australian natives. So keep in mind that taxonomy is the system of classifying organisms, but it's important to bring order to exceptional diversity that exists in our living, um, you know, in our living world. So as classification systems can be superseded as new information arrives, making, you know, that taxonomy, it's constantly evolving as a science. So it's really important that that new information be applied. There's a lot going on in this lesson. So please make sure you review what you need to know, please.